Right. Okay, let's get started. Good to see so many of you here, bright and early in the morning. I'm Tim Perry, Pim Terry on Twitter and everywhere else. And I want to talk about open source projects, some of the problems we have in using them and contributing to them, and some of the ways that some of the exciting new DevOps tools that have been gaining more and more momentum in recent years are going to help us actually solve these issues. So I'm not really going to assume much familiarity with the tools we're going to look at here, um, but I'm also not really going to go into enormous depth in them. I don't want to give you a really complex understanding of these tools. I want to give you an idea of the interesting problems that we need to solve and the kind of tools and options available and the approaches we can use to actually put these into action. If you want to take a closer look at the code that we're going to kind of skim through here, you can pull the slides out and take a look later, and I'll put those up on Twitter. And all of the projects we're actually going to be looking at here are open source, of course, so you can just go pull them down and actually play around with that yourself. Some context first, hopefully. No. <sighs> Drum roll. There we go. Some context first. I work for a company called Softwire. Uh, we make software for everybody else. So we're a bespoke software agency. Uh, we build things for people like the BBC and Cisco and a whole bunch of other companies you haven't heard of. But large businesses, by and large, and at the same time, everything we're building on depends on lots and lots and lots of these open source projects and tools and components. So along the way, we've been trying to put more and more effort into actually contributing back to this as we go. Actually uh, taking changes we can from our projects, taking our spare time and improving the tools we use, and encouraging our clients to do that same kind of thing as well. Encouraging these businesses to engage back with this community that we depend on for pretty much everything. When I'm talking about open source, I'm talking about the entire ecosystem. So going from these tiny little libraries that somebody has thrown up on GitHub to a whole standalone components, databases, web servers, to entire applications. Things like WordPress, where you're depending on a whole bunch of other components and you've got this larger system. Who here in this room doesn't use any open source on their project? Zero people. Excellent. Who doesn't use any open source even every day? Zero people. I have actually had one person who did say that, yes, they don't really use any open source. They worked for a large bank. They weren't really allowed to bring in any external code without thorough, thorough review processes. And this was a huge hassle for them. If you imagine being in that place, your life would be so much more difficult. Open source software is really, really powerful and powers a huge amount of everything we're doing in software development. If you look at all the other talks we've seen, pretty much all of them are building on top of open source components. Stuff like F Sharp nowadays, AngularJS, even the rock music analysis talk we had yesterday, all of that code is up on GitHub and freely licensed. So this has got a huge impact across every single thing we do. And without it, we'd be in a really bad place. And anything we can do to improve it puts us in a better place for everything we're doing day to day. Open source has given us a lot better software. And it also gives us a much easier way of learning about coding. Because of open source, there's so much more code you can just go and have a look at. When you want to understand how an API works, you can go to GitHub, search for the various methods in it, and see a 100, a 1,000 projects using that code, how they're using it, how that works. You can go to your actual tools, dig in, and understand them in more depth because of this different approach. And this also levels the playing field in a way that I don't think exists in any other industry. Because of open source, a student in their bedroom, somebody living in a poorer country, if you can get a computer and the internet, you can get access to the same tools that we're using at the very top tier of the industry. That simply doesn't exist anywhere else. And not only that, but you can get those tools and you can take them apart and dig into exactly how that works. So this is really powerful stuff. And we all win quite a lot by making this better. We improve the world in a nice, feel-good way. The whole software industry develops much faster if we have these better tools and we're working together to share and improve them. 
and individually you depend on open source tools and if you could fix a bunch of bugs in them if you could make them faster and better and nicer to use your day would be more fun so it's pretty powerful that's great uh, but it's also very difficult how many people in this room have contributed changes to an open source project yeah i'm gonna say quarter maybe a little less so all of us are depending on this everybody here everybody else and there's still only a relatively small chunk actually contributing back to it and this is from within a community of developers who are taking their time to come to a conference and get really engaged with software development try and be the best they can be if you imagine the rest of the community you can see that there's lots and lots of people who aren't getting engaged and contributing back to this and that's a perfectly reasonable place to be it is difficult open source is hard to engage with Often the tools are actually just quite hard to use because usability is a hard problem and people want to solve exciting problems instead. And actually contributing to these is tricky as well. Digging into um, some code for a tool you use, actually making a change that is then going to be used by thousands of other projects and developers, it's a scary and difficult thing to be, to do. And we see this publicly. You see tweets like this kind of thing, I'm trying to make a change, it's very scary, it's very difficult, I don't feel confident to be able to do that. Actually picking up and making these changes to these projects requires confidence and is a hard thing to get started with. And you see Stack Overflow questions like this. This is a developer trying to install GitLab. They are enormously struggling. They're clearly experienced developer to some level they have a, they're fairly happy digging into the config files for nginx and yet they can't get this working at all it's not that they can get it up and they're seeing error messages they can't even see the program they're trying to run despite putting a huge amount of effort into this this is a few years ago and we'll look at how gitlab's got better in a minute but this is this is really bad this is terrible ux for a product you want to use and the comments get even worse did you ever manage to fix this no i gave up for me it was simply impossible somebody else threw away all my work started again spent a few days and managed to get it up and running so this is terrible right this is this is a big problem uh, these are experienced developers these are people who outside of open source contribution they know what they're doing they have some experience with programming it shouldn't be this difficult but open source projects aren't like normal professional projects the normal work we do day to day and you can't solve lots of problems in the same way if you join a company if you join a new project it's going to be relatively easy to find somebody who can help you get set up somebody who you can ask questions of in any good company you're going to be in a place where most of the tools you need are going to be available and often companies can make this easier you can provide laptops with the same systems to everybody you can have standard sets of tools that you make available and you can have centralized infrastructure and stuff as well if you've got a complicated test environment you need you can set that up internally and people can run tests in it and this is stuff that all solves difficult problems for us in a normal professional environment and doesn't work in open source instead you've got these teams of totally independent developers who often barely talk to each other at all in many cases the majority of people contributing to a project are going to people who turn up say nothing to anybody put in a single bug fix and then disappear again if you imagine trying to get the same developer experience and effectiveness we have in our teams where we can work closely together where we can run centralized infrastructure in that environment you can see the kind of challenges we're facing so how can we make this a bit better this is a devops talk so the answer to that question is going to be devops over and over again uh, we're just going to kind of throw buzzwords at this problem and exciting tools partly to see if we can and because devops itself is an interesting technology to learn about but also because devops is quite new and interesting and giving us a lot of new automation opportunities a lot of the problems we're talking about here are things that suggest we need better automation things that clearly would be improved if we could make automatic systems just handle them and our automation story for 
The enterprise, particularly, has got much better. If you want to manage thousands of servers, if you want servers that quickly scale up and down with demand, that's got much, much easier as we've built these better tools. And we'd like to be able to put this into action to also solve some of the challenges we're seeing here. To actually look at these, I want to start by focusing on beginners, focusing on people trying to make their first contributions, people trying to pick up tools for the first time that they don't necessarily understand that well. I think this is where the real maximum value is. This is where you most clearly see those problems. Other developers who've contributed to lots of open source projects are going to be familiar with the challenges you face, and you're going to be used to working around, with, uh, working around them and dealing with those issues. For new developers, you don't have that, and you really see the kind of challenges they hit. So for the rest of this talk, I want to imagine that you're a developer. You know how to do a bunch of programming. You're pretty good. You can build a thing. But you haven't yet been contributing back to open source. You don't feel comfortable picking up and using these tools. So let's imagine we're in that place. Perhaps you're working for a company. You've been there for a couple of years. You know how your tools work. One day, you're using a tool that you're pretty familiar with, and you find a bug. Something doesn't do what it's supposed to do. This happens to me every day. <laughs> um, you hit these, these issues, but you've got a pretty good understanding of how this tool works. You've been using it for a while. You get what's going on, and you can see how this bug would have come up. Based on that understanding, you can see where that issue would come from, and so you can see how the fix should work. You can see how you would make the change to solve this. And you think, right, this is open source, great. This is my moment, this is perfect. I can go in, I can fix this, and nobody else ever needs to go through this terrible experience of, of this bug. So you pull down the project, you get hold of the code, you find where this problem is, and yes, you're right, you understand it. You make the change in there to actually fix it. And then you have to take this and work out whether it works and contribute it back. And somehow, often, that is really hard. There are a lot of projects where working out whether your changes are actually going to break other people's code is a hard thing to do, and that's a very scary thing to do. If you're building on a major large project that needs to work in five different language versions or against all these databases or in all these different network configurations, it's really hard to know whether your changes are going to work effectively. And so you get people making these changes, trying to work out and think, ah, I can't just break everything for all these thousands of other people, so I won't contribute to stuff back. As we saw in those tweets, it's too scary. So this happens everywhere. I think an interesting example um, is SQLize, which some people might be familiar with if we've got any Node developers in the audience. SQLize is an ORM for Node.js. If you're trying to write SQL in Node, the vast majority of the time you're going to use SQLize. It's quite good. It does a lot of stuff. It supports as much as they can of the whole uh, SQL spec. There's a lot of different features in there and a lot of complexity. And then it tries to support all of these features across Postgres, MySQL, MariaDB, SQLite, and MS SQL, totally transparently. So here we have a project that a lot of developers are going to be involved in using and be in a pretty good place to contribute back to. If you understand SQL and you're writing Node.js, interacting with SQL, you're going to be using this every day. You're going to see how this works. And often you're going to find bugs and things that could be better. And it'd be great if it was really easy to contribute back to this. But any change you make is really hard to get confidence in. It's really hard to trust that any change you make to SQLize is going to work for all these other databases. It's not going to break one of these thousand other features. So what we need to actually solve this is some way of getting really reliable, reproducible integration tests for these complicated environments. And in a commercial environment, we could set up test harnesses. We could have all these databases up and ready to go and available, whatever. But for open source contributors, where somebody just wants to join a project and get going, you can't really do that. That's a much harder problem to have. So we need a tool that lets us quickly build complex environments in a very reproducible, reliable way for this kind of testing. And this is where our first DevOps tool comes in. We're going to go for Docker here. And this is what SQLize have done to help work and improve on this. Who here has ever used Docker? Yeah, again, maybe a quarter. So 
Docker is a containerization tool. It lets you run containers. And containers here, you can think of like a process that is totally isolated. So it's got its own file system. Uh, it's running in its own environment where, by default at least, it can't interact with anything else on your system. And we can freeze these containers into images. And an image says, OK, we're going to have a system. It's going to have these files in these places, these packages installed, and nothing else. And when you start it, it's going to run this command, perhaps. And with that, we can take an image, and we can start it up, and we can really reliably get exactly the same thing to happen. We can build that exact same environment we can reproduce over and over again. And we can then actually share the definitions of these images or the images themselves with other people, and they can reproduce exactly the same thing. And Docker actually provides Docker Hub, this platform, so that you can push images and share them on there and have pre-built images for a lot of components you may already use, like MySQL, for example, or Postgres. So you can just pull that down and start it, and it will do exactly the same thing on your system that it has done on everybody else's system because it has these isolated, totally reproducible containers. If you're used to virtual machines, you can think of this as being a very similar technology. Under the hood, there's a lot of stuff that's different, but the end result really is just that it's drastically faster. Building images is really effective and has a lot of caching steps along the way so that only the last few changes get duplicated. And actually starting an image uh, in starting up a container from an image is something you can do in well under a second. So you can take this Postgres and start up a new blank one that is exactly the same as every other Postgres pretty much instantly. And you can do that again and again and again. And you can see how this starts to solve some of our problems. Let's take a look at what SQLite's actual implementation looks like. Firstly, you write a Docker file, and this is going to build an image for us. So we say it's based on the normal node Docker file for version 6, and that gives us an environment that is going to reliably run node um, in this clean, reliable way. We also want the Postgres bindings on there so that we can connect to Postgres. We copy in a couple of files and settings and pull down our dependencies. And then we uh, expose a volume. So this lets us share that bit of the file system inside the container with what's going on outside. This gives us somewhere where we can run the node part of our testing, at least, very reproducibly. We now have a container that we have an image that, when you run it, is always going to have exactly the same environment for running this node code. And our unit tests, for example, are always going to get exactly the same results, no matter what machine we run it on, no matter what settings. So this gives us a single image, but we're looking at integration tests. We want to be able to integrate with more complicated infrastructure. And the way we do that here is we use Docker Compose. We take one image, and we link it together with other images. And that looks like this. We have three sections here. The first one, SQLize, says build the current directory, build that previous Docker file we looked at, and get an image that is going to reliably run Node in this way, and then link it up to MySQL and Postgres, which is the other two images further down. Use the volume inside this container to have our current code. So we take our current version of SQLize we're working with and we put it inside this Node container. Uh, and then there's a couple of little bits of config in there. And then we just pull down Postgres and MySQL. And here we just reference these by name, and that comes from Docker Hub. People have published, I believe the Postgres and MySQL teams, have published images for a perfectly working, correctly set up Postgres of this version. And you can just pull it down, link it together, and get exactly that reliable environment. And if you run this Compose, you'll get a node environment that is the same node environment every other SQLized developer is using, and this exact version of Postgres and this exact version of MySQL that work exactly the same as everybody else's. And to actually do that is pretty easy. Once you've checked out the SQLized code, you run this command, which is a bit more complicated than it could be. So they've aliased it down, and you actually just run this. If you want to do these complex integration tests against uh, these databases here, you check out the SQLize code, you run this one command, and you get exactly the test suite that everybody else is running. You have these totally reproducible tests for this relatively complicated environment. This only actually covers uh, SQLite, MySQL, and Postgres here. So we've only got um, half of the databases they're looking for, but they're looking at extending this 
And this already gives you a lot of the confidence that was really hard to get before. If you wanted to do this before, you had to install Postgres yourself, configure it, and hope you'd done so in a way that made your tests representative and so on. You don't need to do any of that anymore. You check out the project, start it up, and these isolated containers click together to give you that reproducible environment. This works well for database integration stuff, but there's loads of other cases, other projects where you have the same problem, and you can extend the solution to do that. Things like compiling for many different language versions. We could have a lot of containers for different versions of Node, for example, and run our tests in each of those and know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, networking infrastructure, we can compose together to describe different network structures, um, different browser engine versions, this kind of thing. We can simulate a lot of complicated environments. Let's try a different case. So, you don't just want to contribute now to a library. Instead, you want to contribute to a larger whole application. You've got something more complicated that you want to run. And it's not just about being able to quickly run tests here, but getting this whole complicated structure up and running so that you can start making changes and see those changes in action. I think a good example for this is the 24 pull requests project. This is a, a really great project. It's a challenge for open source developers to contribute 24 pull requests to GitHub projects in the 24 days in the run-up to Christmas, spreading the Christmas cheer through uh, code contributions. So this is actually now pretty popular. There's about 10,000 people doing it last year. Um, and it's expanding and expanding. It looks something like this. You get a page with kind of all your contributions pulled together, and they've got a bunch of leaderboards and this kind of thing as well. This integrates with GitHub, obviously, for the data and authentication. It also integrates with Twitter to send out uh, notifications and updates. It integrates with email services to send you out project suggestions, if that's something you're interested in. And it's got its own database, and then there's various other moving parts inside. So there's a lot of complicated bits and pieces. And this is also a really popular target as a thing to contribute to. If you join this project and you're looking for open source things to contribute to, you think, OK, great, I want to make a change. I want to improve the world a little bit. What shall I improve? And you're looking at the screen and you're thinking, hey, actually, the styling could be a bit better here. Wouldn't it be great if we had another leaderboard that showed this information? Wouldn't it be awesome if we had uh, an integration with this other tool? So you check out 24 pull requests and you think, right, I'll, I'll set this up. I'll get this running. I'll make that change and see how it works. And if you want to get 24 pull requests running, what you do is you check it out, and then you install RubyEnv and RubyBuild, and you install this version of Ruby, and you install Postgres, and you configure Postgres, and you install Node and Phantom, so you can get some of the testing infrastructure working. Um, you install all the gem dependencies, which, if you're coming from a Windows background, is going to be a painful experience a lot of the time. You then have to go and create all your databases. You then have to go and migrate all your databases. You then have to put some test data in there so that the site actually works and is useful. And so, again, the tests pass. And you then need something to fake out your email server. And then you can finally start it. And this is a much longer list, really, than you wanted when you thought, hey, wouldn't the styling be better if I tweaked this slightly in the corner? This is complicated. This is pretty much straight from their readme. And the worst part of this is that, of course, it's not actually going to work. You're going to have to go in and somehow try and fix this thing. And just because you maybe know Ruby and you're happy getting involved with that part, that doesn't necessarily mean you really understand how to configure Postgres or you're super familiar with setting up a node environment. So you're going to lose people here. You're going to have people who get stuck and just give up. Just panic and leave because this is hard. And because of that, 24 pull requests isn't as good as it could be. If we make projects hard to contribute to, they're less good. They have less people, fewer people, getting involved and improving them. And we'd like as much as possible to make it as easy as possible to people, for people to pick up these projects and get going. So this has some similarities to the previous case, but some big differences. We don't really care about that quick reproducibility that we're looking at. Instead, we want whole, much more complex environments. And what we're really looking for is to make that as easy as possible so developers can just get started with a whole working system with all these moving parts. 
And preferably, we don't want to have to just write a shell script to set up all this kind of stuff, because that's going to be hard to maintain and painful. And that would be the classic approach if you were doing this with Docker. So 24 pull requests have fixed this. And there's two core steps. First, we need a tool to automate all of these painful steps. And here we're going to use Ansible. Ansible is a provisioning tool. You point it at a machine and say, I'd like this machine to have all of these things installed and ready and working. So if you've ever used Chef or Puppet, it's a kind of similar idea to those. Uh, but the main difference for Ansible is that it's what's called agentless. For Chef or Puppet, which are built much more for enterprise uh, use, the standard architecture is to run a central server that says, OK, this is what everybody should be doing. I know you guys should be web servers, and you should be databases. And then have an agent on each of your other nodes that connects to that central server and says, what should I be doing? Oh, I should be a web server. OK, I'll set up these things. And that's kind of useful, and it's an interesting approach for a lot of stuff. But Ansible does the opposite. Instead of having all these agents pulling config, you push config over SSH. So you run Ansible, and you say, I'd like to tell these, these three to be web servers, and you push those instructions out to them and set them up. And that might not work quite as well in a large enterprise environment. I don't know. But here, it's perfect. In an open source project, typically we want to be setting up one machine to run this stuff. And we want to be able to just push it and say, make this system ready to go for development. So it gives us this much more lightweight, easy solution to doing that kind of thing. Again, let's skim through the code for this. Uh, at the top level, if you're trying to configure Ansible, you write a playbook like this. And this says, for every host that I apply this to, um, here's a bunch of variables. So we're going to set up the uh, server we're talking about to have these packages installed and to be using UTC because a fun bit left out of that readme is the tests will fail if you're not in UTC. Uh, and then we're going to pull in some Postgres config and then we've got these roles and this is kind of the interesting bit. Every server we apply this to, we're going to init it with standard uh, operating system setup stuff. So install those packages, set the time zone, this kind of thing. We're then going to install Ruby and all the dependencies. We're going to install and configure Postgres and set all of that up. And then we're going to do the app-specific bits. By breaking these up, this becomes much more maintainable. And it also becomes something you can share around. You can pull down roles from other people that already handle the Ruby part of this or whatever. And the actual roles look something like this. These are pretty much a direct translation of the uh, readme requirements we were looking at before. Install Node.js, run this command, run this command, run this command. So these are relatively easy to write, but as soon as you do this, you get a lot of extra power for automation for this kind of stuff, particularly for things like the apt steps here. Ansible understands what that actually means, and if Node and Phantom are already installed, it won't do that again, this kind of thing. So there's, this is simplified, and there's lots of other bits and pieces here. But this is a nice way of automating those individual setup steps. This then, to actually run it, looks like this. And you have another file that says which, uh, an inventory that says which hosts you're going to run it against. And just like that, you point it at a server, and you say, set it up like this. And that gets us pretty close, but it doesn't actually work in lots of places. Anywhere where you can't install apt packages, for example, is uh, simply not really supported. Anywhere where you're not happy changing the time zone to UTC, which is probably your own computer, you can't really use this. You don't want to change your time zone just so that you can run some tests. That's an uh, enormous hassle. So the second step of this setup process is using the same provisioning, but isolating a machine to do that. And for this, we use Vagrant. Anybody used Vagrant in the audience? Anyone familiar with Vagrant? Ah, yeah. Again, a little under a quarter. Cool. Uh, Vagrant's great. I really like Vagrant. Vagrant is a tool you can think of as being a level above both these provisioning tools we've talked about here and the kind of isolation tools like uh, VirtualBox for virtual machines or Docker for containers or whatever. Vagrant is designed to manage developer environments and do so by understanding all the provisioners you might want to use, Ansible or just a shell script or whatever else, and understanding VirtualBox or Docker and happily glue them together and make that work 
everywhere really easily so that you can just spin up uh, Vagrant on Windows or Mac or Linux and just have the same thing happen, have it deal with all the little differences between these various systems. The actual config for that looks like this. So we say, I'm going to be using VirtualBox with these settings. We're going to be using an Ubuntu image. This is the network config. And I'd like you to provision it with Ansible. And here's the config. And it glues all of that stuff together for us. You could build this yourself out of Docker and Docker Compose. But that becomes quite a bit more complicated. You have to get more involved with the shell scripts to manage Ansible, this sort of stuff. And Docker. Compose particularly is getting better at managing this stuff, but right now Vagrant is a pretty good option. And this gives you a really nice end experience. As a user, if you want to get 24 Progress running and start play with it, you install Vagrant and VirtualBox, you check out the 24 pull requests code, and you run Vagrant up. And then on your local machine, on whatever that IP address is, somewhere in the middle there, you go to that and you immediately see a running version of 24 pull requests on your machine. No matter what platform you're running, no matter what is going on in your system, all of those steps just kind of work and you can start actually getting involved and playing around with it. And just like this, you get a lot more contributors to your projects, you get a lot more people involved and playing around. Let's take a look at one last problem. Perhaps you've got an open source project that you like that seems really neat and useful and you want to actually take it and put it into production. You've got some big useful component, some entire application and you want to take it live. So this again has similarities to some of the provisioning things we've talked about here, uh, but with even more complexity. When we're talking about developer environment production environments instead of developer environments, we have to start thinking about sensible security defaults. We have to start thinking about migration and update paths for the future so that we can maintain this software when we actually keep running it. We have these bunch of extra concerns. And as much as possible, we'd like to use software that just handles that for us. If there's a great open source tool, but it's going to take a couple of hours a week just for me to manage the extra hassle around it, I'm just not going to use it. So we want to get rid of that kind of stuff. A fun example for this is Status. Status is an open source project that lets you build status sites. As you may have seen for loads of developer tools, things like this. Is the site currently up? Are these various components working? Are we doing any maintenance? This sort of stuff. A standard component you're going to want to use in a lot of applications if you're building particularly developer focused systems. And this has this nice front end like this, and it's also got an admin panel for controlling all of this sort of stuff. And then on top of that, you can sign up for notifications and so on. And under the hood, again, much like 24 pull requests, we've got a Ruby system here that is quite painful to set up. We've got all these little moving parts. We've got all these inter integrations with everything. You don't really want to care about and understand this just to put this system that people have used a thousand times into your environment. And the worst bit of this, I think, is hidden away in the middle. You have to actually install Git on the server that you want to run this and clone the current code from GitHub. That's the deployment mechanism. This isn't great for a whole bunch of reasons. You probably don't want Git to be running unnecessarily on your production servers. Worse than that, once you've checked out this code, you've now got the whole code base. You've got the code you want to run, and you've got all the tests. You've got all the other metadata, and all of that is sitting there on your server. And there's potentially interesting security risks with this kind of thing, but it's also just a right hassle for upgrade management and so on in the future. If I, my options are either to leave all these tests here lying around on the production server or delete them and then have to mess around with that when I upgrade by pulling from GitHub and merging things across. That sounds like a bit of a mess. I'd like something where I didn't even see all these internal details. I didn't have to know or understand them and everything just worked. So we want something that gives us this much simpler software distribution and hides all of those details. And for this, again, we're going to go back to Docker. Not now for reproducibility, but for the bundling and distribution options. Once we've got a working Docker image that will exactly run a whole status system, we can share it with other people, and they can get those up and running. That looks like this for status. 
So we install MySQL in the image and we give it a temporary password and we'll tweak this a little bit later. Then we pull in the status code and its dependencies. We set this entry point here and this is, defines a script that is going to get run with the first time this image starts. You can think of this as kind of compile time versus runtime. Everything here gets run and set up when you build the image that you're going to send to everybody. And then that script, that shell script, gets run at runtime when the end users actually start up a container from this image. And then we expose two volumes, and this lets us have data that has a separate lifetime to the container. So uh, we can keep the database and we can keep various bits of config separate from the container. And when a new version of status comes out, we can kill this container, get the new one connected up to the same volumes, and have it do a sensible thing. The actual code for the shell script to make all of this work looks like this. Again, I don't want to dig into the real fine details of this code. The interesting thing is that we've got two cases here to handle that upgrade path. We check whether there's already config persisted. And if there isn't, we generate a new password for the database. We build some config for that and we persist it. Um, and we set up a whole new blank database ready to go. And if there's already config, then we migrate the existing database. We connect to that and keep using that. And by moving this into that runtime path, we get those sensible secure defaults, like random passwords for our databases, rather than having every status user use exactly the same password in all their systems. And we make upgrade and migration fairly easy. With this now, you don't even need to interact with the source code for status. We can take the image that includes all of this, push it to Docker Hub, and everybody else can just pull that straight down from the command line. If you want to run status in your system now, you install Docker and then run this one command. There's no other steps. This pulls down Adam Cook slash status, which is the published image of this from Docker Hub, and on port 80 on your local machine, hosts what was coming out from port 5000 on the container. And you immediately have a running status up and ready to go that you can just start playing around with. And all those steps totally disappear, and we've got this bundling tool that lets us distribute these kind of things. This actually isn't really the right way of using Docker. What you're supposed to do when you've got multiple components here, like a Ruby process and MySQL, is have multiple containers and link them together. And for your own applications, that's a good thing to do. There are a lot of good benefits that you get out of this. But bundling with Docker Compose there doesn't really work. The best equivalent we can come up with for this uh, looks something like that, which, were it not for the fact this screen is enormous, would be fairly unreadable. There's not really a great distribution story for Docker Compose yet. We don't have a good way of taking an application that's many containers and sharing it with other people. And there's people working on that, but that's not quite there yet. So bundling everything into just one container is actually quite a nice solution. Let's look at one last option here. What happens if we don't want to install Docker? What happens if you're uh, not totally convinced by all this trendy DevOps tech? And we'd like to come up with another option that gives us this same isolated, bundled, ready-to-go experience for an open source project, but which doesn't depend on a trendy tech that might disappear two years from now. GitLab are a good example of a project that's done this. GitLab are the project we saw in that Stack Overflow question at the beginning that was extremely difficult and painful and soul-destroying to set up. They're a open source GitHub competitor more or less. They look something like this. It's much of the UI you might kind of expect. And it also does things like it's got a chat interface and continuous integration, all this kind of stuff. It's quite a big project. They've got 100,000 organizations using it, including NASA, including CERN. They've got 1,300 open source contributors getting involved. And it's a big, complicated piece of software. It's got all of its own code, and then on top of that, we've got Redis, we've got Nginx, we've got Postgres, we've got Python, we've got Node, and we've got Ruby all running on the inside of this. And actually installing that is a painful thing, as we saw before. It's hard to do, and it doesn't really work. And you can sort of do Dockerish things with this if you liked, but not everybody wants to use Docker. So we need a tool that lets us build equivalent bundles. And 
here, we come to something called Chef Omnibus. So this is made by the Chef team, who I mentioned a little bit earlier. That's a major provisioning tool and takes a lot of the same ideas you use for provisioning a server, but uses them instead to build full stack installers, native installers for every platform. So we can take a single code base and a single set of config and we can build RPMs and Debian packages and self-extracting tables and Windows MSIs and OSX disk images. And we can build the whole bunch totally automatically. And we can bundle everything inside them. So this is a slightly interesting design decision. But here, uh, GitLab, when using this, you take Nginx, you take Redis, you take Postgres, you compile them all and you put them all inside this one enormous package. Just because it then reliably works everywhere. It's not particularly elegant, but it delivers an incredible experience for end users. The actual code to do this, I'm going to skim through even quicker. This is large and complicated and not really something I'd suggest setting up yourself. Uh, there's a lot more maintenance involved. But I want to really show you that we have the tools and the tools are getting better and better to solve these problems, even in really big, complicated cases. So this is the top level config. It defines a bunch of metadata and then a series of dependencies that we're going to bundle into the resulting packages. And for each of those packages, we have another config file that defines that dependency, which looks like this and says, I'm going to pull down, for example, the Nginx code. I want it to have exactly this hash so we can try and get some reproducibility. And I'm going to compile it in this way. And that gives us the end result. GitLab only actually do this for Linux, although you could potentially expand it. But GitLab doesn't actually run on Windows or OS X. So they're just building a variety of Linux packages with this. But with config like this, you can build all those packages totally automatically. And the experience to install GitLab now is not this huge multi-day fight, but is instead a single command. We've taken it from that case where people are dedicating weeks of their life to fighting a piece of software, which is a very sad story. And instead, you start seeing tweets like this. I installed GitLab in two minutes. It's the kind of thing you can do just to have a play around with it and see, which was simply not the case before. And this is how you drive open source projects so that they get all these extra users, so that they get all these extra contributors, and so that these projects get better and better, easier to use, more bug fixes coming in, working faster. GitLab will be improving, will be more used, more popular, and CI and people like GitHub are going to be pushed into improving better as well because we've made changes like this. So, to reca recap and wrap up, wrap up, what can you do with DevOps to make open source more accessible? We can try and build confidence-inspiring test environments. We can make it so that you can take some changes and know that they're going to work, even in complicated cases. We can make developer setup for local environments really easy, using things like Vagrant particularly, so that you can just, in one command, locally get a full running stack of this application that you can easily play around with. And we can make the end distribution system as painless as possible. We can make it so that these applications are something you can just take, and set up on your server, and start using. And by doing that, drive more and more adoption. This is just kind of the start. These are some interesting ideas that are already out there and exist, but there's a whole bunch more. Things like documentation building and publishing definitely need a bunch of work. Tools to automate initial project setup. Tools to help maintainers maintain these tools. There's a lot of extra DevOps work involved and more of a shift towards DevOps culture that we need in open source. A focus on the value of, automata of automation to actually fix these. That's everything I want to talk about for you, with you today. I am Pim Terry, and I'll be sticking the slides out on Twitter so you can take a more detailed look through these bits and pieces. Open source, as we've seen, is really important to everything we do, everything we as an industry build, everything we as a conference are talking about. But underneath, there's some big problems. There are interesting, difficult challenges and stuff that doesn't work well, and these are no longer unsolvable. We started coming up with new solutions for stuff that for a long time we just ignored as something you couldn't really deal with. These projects are just kind of the successful few. There's a lot of other options that don't have this that still are hard to set up, that still are hard to get involved with. And if you're interested in DevOps tools, I'd really encourage you to keep an eye out for projects 
that aren't really working like this, to learn the kind of tools we've talked about here for yourself and for your own commercial professional use, but also for these projects. Play around with them by setting up Docker to make a project much easier to deal with and use. Learn Vagrant by helping a project become more accessible. You can help, you can get involved with this stuff and learn a lot about DevOps along the way. And we can all work together and make open source a little bit more open for everybody. Thank you very much. I think we might have a little bit of time for a couple of questions. Any takers? Drum roll. No? OK, great. Uh, well, I will be around for the rest of the day and whatever ends up happening this evening. Do feel free to just come and grab me and talk about this kind of stuff uh, or anything else. Yeah, thank you very much.